All right. Hi, everybody. This is sort of a catch-all video that I'm going to show you a couple basics of how to use data. And one of the main tools that I use to sort of take massive swaths of data and then sort of make sense of them. So beginning, first section of the video is basically just some Excel tricks. I know you can't see my keyboard. I'm not that fancy. But when you are dealing with something this big, so I have about 1,400 sets of, these are genes right here. And these are all down here. These are all RNA values. So remember, RNA can go up and down, right? And that's how we can track what's high, what's low in a specific patient's cancer, right? Now, between this, as you can tell on the, on the bottom left right there, I actually have 418 patients. So navigating this thing is, can be pretty big, right? It's not good to like just scroll around. So one way to quicken things up, and as you can tell, I can like kind of fly around this whole data set like this. If you hold control and then one of the arrows, you can just fly up and down all you want. It's really good. Next tip, if you hold shift and you start going and like going in different directions, you can start highlighting everything. This is much better than dragging, right? Okay, put these two things together. If I want all the overall survival data status, but I also want all the PFS data and PFS status, instead of just dragging down forever, hold shift, I can highlight everything that I want. And while I keep holding shift, click control, it goes really fast, right? And now I can copy this, I can do all kinds of good stuff. So we don't have to cover um, overall survival and progression free for survival, because I'm pretty sure I already have a video on that. So check that one out if you want to learn how to make curves. Again, curves are probably one of your best ways to get, you know, importance across in a medical field. Okay, so looking at this, what I actually have is sets of data here from a paper titled Zoo 2022, and this is fully integrated data. But the good thing with this is that we have over here, we have case number, and these are all patients right here that they sequenced. Here is a bunch of clinical data, how long they survived, what type of cell of origin they were. And then next we have, these are mutations. Zeros and ones are typically good, a good way to notate mutations. You either have a one, you've got the mutation in that gene, or zero, you're fine. You got the wild type gene. Now, going through here, it looks like we have about, yeah, there we go, we can end right there. Watch me scroll like that. We got 70 genes that we have sequenced DNA for. Great, zeros and ones. Now, remember, DNA mutations, they're there or they're not there. It's not quite always as simple as that because tumors are very heterogeneous things, but this is the best tool we got, right? Now, back to our RNA over here, sequenced 1,400 genes for their RNA expression, that up and down level, right? So everything in here is, uh, there's three factors in this sheet that are fully integrated. There's clinical, DNA, RNA, right? So using and collecting this, Actually, this is so embarrassing, but I'm gonna go delete this part. Oh no, we're good. Okay. So control A, select all, select everything. Okay. Take this to a tool called Morpheus, software from the Broad Institute, their Harvard's like bioinformatics wing. Click here, control paste, okay? Now, what this is doing right here is it's asking you where does the data begin and where did the like, clinical like associations begin, or should I say annotations for each patient. Now, a lot of the times we would not count mutations like what I'm scrolling through right here as annotations. We would count those as the actual data. But in this case, I'm only interested in the RNA in this case. And what we're about to do is something called an integrative analysis. And this is what I'm actually gonna have a lot of you try using this data set. Okay. So click here at the first piece, this 362. That is the first value that is data as we're seeing it. Everything else is just a factor of patients. We're gonna treat the DNA mutations as factors, not as raw data in this analysis. Okay, so go ahead and you'll actually have to transpose this. The program reads rows relatively. So what you're seeing right here with colors is the relative expression for each row. And as you can see, as we scroll around here for these genes on the right, people have different expression levels of genes. And on the top, you see all the patients, right? Pretty cool. Red meaning high expression, blue meaning, you know, low middle or uh, low and white or kind of sort of that tan gray kind of in the middle, right? So pretty big. Next thing you can do here is go to tools. 
first thing I'm actually going to have you do is something called marker selection. Marker selection is going to say, what are the key differences between two groups? Okay. Go here and you're going to use a t-test. T-test is going to say, what are the mean values of group one versus group two for all 1400 RNA genes that we've got data for? Cool stuff, right? So I can decide what I want to predict on, right? There's a lot of good stuff in here. These are all mutations. What I want to know, for example, is what, what patient tumors look like with certain mutations versus others. So I'm actually going to look for one right here. I'm going to look for, I kind of want like a bigger one. Like, yeah, like I want like a, something a little heavier duty. Let's go here. P53, most of you know this. I do, we do some research on this. This is a big time tumor suppressor. Class A, this is going to be people that have the mutation. Class B will be people that do not have the mutation. Leave permutations at zero. Number of markers, um, you can just go and do, do a thousand. Uh, it's basically on either side, how many genes are we going to analyze? Do a thousand because then I want, if we only have 1,400, it'll do the top thousand, bottom thousand, and that'll just make it so that all 1,400 genes get analyzed. Okay, so let's do this. We're dividing and statistically taking a look at P53 mutant people versus not mutant tumors. Let's go. Okay. So on the top right here, you can see we have a group in green right here. Those were our TPP, uh, P53 mutants. See how there's like a big red collection right here? And then quite a bit more blue. It's hard to visualize every time, but these are all the wild types in this case. So what we have over here are all the genes that these are significantly high in P53 mutants. Now, p-values you may remember from, oh, that's a significance value. 0 0.05 is significant, right? In a single test, yes, but we just tested 1,400 tests. We have to correct for that. Whenever you see the word FDR, that's a corrected p-value. That's a trustworthy p-value. So we want a 0 0.05 from this value over here. I'm actually going to bump these, get those a little more definite. So everything right here that we've got, these genes are high when you have a P53 mutation. Now, equally, we go downstairs down here. Here's everything that is very statistically significantly low in a P53 mutation. And there's quite a bit of stuff that's lost right here that I'm highlighting. Pretty cool. So what I'm gonna do is just highlight all these genes right here that we've got that were P53 mutants. And actually, actually, a quick way to do this is just take this data. Let's go back to our Excel sheet. Don't mess up your first sheet, but you can just take data, whatever you got right here. Here's all your genes. Here's that FDR value. This is a little quick way to do this. T value is kind of the direction of which one it pulled. So in this case, our positive T values are the ones that are up when we have that mutation. So Next piece, next sort of analysis I wanted to show you is, all right, so we had these genes, right, that were really low after P53 was gone, right? So let's take these ones right here. Let's copy these. We're actually going to go to a new online tool called Top Fun. I know it's kind of a goofy little name, but check this out. So all these genes that we got in here, like, you know, I'm a lymphoma person. I don't know every single one of these genes. There's 62 of them, right? I know some of these characters, sure. What this tool does, and it's very easy to do, is it takes groups of genes and it tells me with statistical significance, what are these genes involved in? So we just lost P53 in these patients. What exactly is kind of going on in their tumors, right? Right here, you can see a lot of stuff here. It's a big one right here. When you lose P53, you lose a lot of immune signaling. You lose a lot of the ability to do apoptosis or a cell to die, right? To lose the ability to die and survive indefinitely, it's exactly what a cancer cell wants, right? So you can look through all these pieces right here and you can see what exactly is going on in these tumors and it makes the picture a lot more easy, right? You can see where a lot of this is happening. Uh, you can see some human need, um, phenotypes. Usually it's good to see a sanity check, for example, like we just did a major lymphoma mutation and yeah, first phenotype that shows up with the genes that are bad, hematological and neoplasm. That's us. Um, domain's a little advanced. I wouldn't worry. Pathway's a very good one. 
Pathway can show you exactly like, okay, like what's going on right here? Again, sanity check right here. P53 affecting proteins all down after the mutation, right? Pretty big deal. Okay, IL-6, that's a big immune signaler. It's actually a pretty good insight right there. Things like that. Interactions is another very good one because again, you can take these genes and say, oh, wow, it looks like these genes sort of had a larger role after, or maybe, no, their role is diminished as well because their interactants went down. Kind of cool stuff. Um, again, this is pretty, this is pretty good. Uh, drug shows up sometimes, but it's not very reliable to say like, oh, like treat with this drug. It's not really that. Uh, disease, as you can tell, leukemias, lymphomas, again, a good sanity check. So that's how you can use top chain, or top fun, top functional enrichment is what it's technically called. Okay. So if I go back over here, no, actually, I want to do this. Another really good tool that you can use in Morpheus is something called nearest neighbors. So I'm actually going to go and I want to actually find something maybe a little different. So among all these genes, I personally know CDK2NA is a very big time tumor suppressor as well. It's actually high when P53 is lost. That's actually kind of cool, right? Something kind of comes up and tries to help when you lose another tumor suppressor. So I'm gonna say nearest neighbor, and I want just the selected row. What a nearest neighbor is gonna say is what genes are high when CDKN2A is high, what genes are low when it's low, right? So this Pearson correlation that I have for CDK to NA, see what we're matching up with. Here's all the genes that have a very close association. When they're up or when they're down, CDK and 2A is up or respectively down. So this is actually a pretty cool list. I might be saving this for later. Now, at the bottom, Pearson correlation values are what we're looking at right here. Negative values means that they are, in, they are inversely related. These genes that I've got my highlight on right here, negative Pearson values means that they, when they're high, CDKNA2A is low. When they're low, CDKN2A is high. It's an inverse relationship in that case. So given that, there are a lot of tools that you can use in this, uh, in Morpheus to get quite a bit of, quite a few like very good answers. Um, I would say that marker selection is the most important. Get me, and you can kind of like, you know, get the data kind of rolling up kind of like this too. One cool way is you can actually make really nice looking heat maps. So I'll be honest, at this point in the video, this is more like blue text. If you guys know me in class, um, this is helpful, but like I'm, you won't do this as much. So keep watching if you're interested, but you've hit the main points at this, at this stage. So what I would probably do here is actually run another marker analysis, get a new sheet. And we'll put in the same parameters as last time, except this time I am only going to analyze 50 genes this time. So this one's going to be a lot like cleaner and more fun to look at. So go to view and then fit everything to the window. Now you can kind of see, see how this is a lot more like red and then blue, right? Like we've really selected really good genes that are high in P53 and low in P53, as opposed to when that gene is not having an issue. The other um, sometimes cool thing that we can do is something called hierarchical clustering. This is just gonna say what genes are alike, which ones aren't. Um, let's actually just cluster up our rows and see how they look. Sometimes it gets so busy that it's not fun, but no, it did pretty well here. So remember, I already made two groups, so this is gonna have two little families right here. See how right about there, the family split. This is basically showing me, it's right there. It's showing me since I already kind of synthetically did this, that there are two major families, genes that are high with P53 and genes that are low. Now we can look down here too and see which ones, the closer that family is to the blue and to the red, like right there, like the closer it is, the closer those two genes mirror one another. And that relationship can tell us a lot about what's up and what's down and what programs are kind of rolling in different phenotypes like we've done today with P53. So if you zoom in right here, these genes right here are very closely following one of the three of themselves. So I don't know if I can actually, I kind of want to see that. Um, yeah, so I want to go back down here. Yeah, I kind of want to see that. These three genes are STAT-IRF1 and STAT-4. 
yeah, some of these little, yeah, everything we got down here. Yeah, highly related. I know that as a lymphoma person, so kind of kind of fun stuff. All right, otherwise, pretty cool. Again, lots of tools that you can use. Um, you can technically make them, just a figure just like that, like I just did, and pop it onto a poster. This is why bioinformatics is so fun and easy. Once you figure out how to use some of these great tools, you can make tons of in silico figures that are really helpful. So I'd say this is about the end. Thanks for watching. And um, yeah, let's get to work. It'll be good.